Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so as Missy said, we are looking today at the 10 Commandments, which I'm going to skip over. She's, she's done a great job of covering that. I want to focus on the second thing she talked about, which is the passage that was read, love the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. This particular passage is considered one of the holiest, if not the most holy, in all of Judaism and in all of Christianity. This instruction to love God is considered by both religions the most important thing that we can learn how to do. So I want to look at it carefully. And the question I'd like to ask as we dig into it a little deeper, is loving God the same as loving a person? Or is it different? It's the same in a couple ways. It's different in several. It's the same in that love for people and love for God starts with a feeling. It's a feeling that we have within us. And you can think of, I mean, poets go on and on about the feelings of love, but we're talking about warmth. We're talking about belonging. We're talking about safety. We're talking about connection. We're talking about a desire for the person that you love. All these things, true for our love for people and our love for God, that feeling is the same. Also the same is that love without action is not love. Love without action means it, it's not love. So if you have all the feelings, but you act in a way that hurts the person, it negates the feelings. You don't get to count the feelings as love anymore. They don't count. <laughs> The action negate the feelings. Love, loving action is required if you're going to call the feelings love. And that's the same for people, and it's the same for God. Now, how do we act lovingly toward God? That's what we need to kind of break down a little bit. Because love for people and love for God is different in several ways. One is that God is invisible, and people are not. I don't know any invisible people. God is invisible, God is mysterious, God cannot be fully known by any of us. And so in order for us, and we like to have something to direct our love to, we like to have an object for our love. And so how do you love that which is invisible, that which is indefinable, that which is mysterious? And so what we do is we create images in our minds. We imagine what God might be like and we direct our love kind of toward that image. And so. Some people imagine God as a father, a perfect, loving, not fallible the way a human father is, a perfect, loving father. Other people prefer mother. God is a loving mother. Some people don't like to put gender on God and they'll say parents. But these are all images that we're creating in our minds, this invisible, indefinable thing that is God. What's, an, what's a way that we can put a handle on that and direct our love toward it? Creator. Some people will say universe. Some people say God is the universe. God is all that is seen and unseen. And then Christians, many Christians will say, Jesus is my image of God. Jesus is the most perfect image of God that we can have as human beings. Jesus is God in human form. And so people say, I love Jesus. And they're saying, I love God. I love the way Jesus acted in the world. I love the things he taught. I love that he died and rose from the dead. And that, to me, is the most tangible expression of God that I can think of. I love Jesus. All of those are actually fine. If they help us to give us a direction, an object, to get that love in our hearts moving toward the divine, it's great. We also have to be a little careful with the images. We get some pretty strong warnings in the Bible, including in the Ten Commandments, about these images, that we can love the image more than what the image represents. We can love the, the image of Jesus even more than the God that Jesus represents. We can start to make God into a father, and it, God has to be a father, and God has to be a male, 
and we lose what that is supposed to represent. And so we have to be a little, we have to hold these images lightly. We have to be willing to say, yes, this is my image for God. And it's, it's a little straw image. It's a little sandcastle that I built in the image of God that could get washed away by the waves. And then to love this invisible God comes the kind of hard part is how do you put that love into action? If action is required for love to be love, how do you love that which is invisible? Another way to say this is how do you bring God soup? Because if somebody's sick and you love that person, you express your love by bringing them soup. How do you bring God soup? And Jesus has an answer for that question. Jesus says the greatest commandment is the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And he said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So that we then put love in our love for God into action by loving people, by loving people who are hurting, by loving people who are in need, by loving people who are near us physically, by loving people who are far away. So that's part of the difference is that this invisible God requires images and requires us to direct our action toward people in order to express our love for God. A second way that God is different in the way we love God is different than the way we love people is God is more powerful than we are. And people in loving relationships should not be more powerful. I mean, yes, you can have a child and a parent and there's a power differential there. But even then, you really are just two human beings who are trying to love each other uh, with the roles you've been given. But in general, the love that we have for people is love between equals, whether it's our spouse or our siblings or our neighbors or our coworkers. The love we have for God is a love for whatever God is, and it's more than we are. It is transcendent. It is powerful. It has the power to create and destroy life, this thing we call God. It has the power to know us, to know our every thought, our every feeling, our every action, our future, and our past. How do you love a God like that? How do you love a God that is more powerful than you? And one thing we have to start with is we must determine if that God, that most powerful, all-powerful God is trustworthy. And you'll find throughout the Old Testament in particular that they spend a lot of time establishing that God is trustworthy. God is faithful. Even though we see a lot of suffering in this world and bad things happen to us, the people of Israel, God is faithful to us. God is trustworthy. God is good. Even this God that has the power to destroy as well as create. Even this God that seems to withdraw from us sometimes and be hard to reach. This God is trustworthy and this God is good. And then come some words that we don't like in this society. Because using these words to describe a relationship with people is fraught with danger. But if we use these words to describe our relationship with God, it opens up a whole new world for us. Words like submission, obedience, discipleship. To love God is to submit to God's will in a way that we are never called to submit to the will of another person. I mean, there may be times when we put our own feelings and interests aside in a relationship with another person for their, for their well-being, but we never submit. We never say, you are, I will do what you say. But when we seek to love God, we are always seeking God's will and how to submit ourselves to something larger than ourselves, to be obedient to what God wants for us, to be a disciple. I think the, the relationship that might be the best description of this for me is a apprentice to a master in some kind of craft. We saw this in an example of this a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we were at the Renaissance Festival and they had a glass blowing exhibit and they did a demonstration. And there was sort of the old wise glass blower who talked through the process of glass blowing. And then there was the apprentice 
who was pretty, looked like a master himself, but he was a you know, grown man. He wasn't sort of like a little boy, but he was the apprentice learning under the master. And he did all the work. He created the creation in front of us in half an hour from this glob of molten glass to this beautiful vase. And what the master did and the presenter said, I don't know what he's going to create. He's learned from me. He's learned all the skills. He's learned about the tools. He's learned about the procedures and the process of making this vase. But I don't know what he's going to create. And I'm going to be figuring, I'm going to see what happens with the same as you are. And I bet I'll figure it out partway through, and you won't know. But I don't know. He's the creative, he, he has the creative freedom to do what he wants. I wonder if that's like our relationship with God, that we are an apprentice and we are trying to learn the ways to live a good life, the methods, the tools, the procedures, the skills, through habit and through practice. We're trying to learn how to create this good life. And God gives us the freedom to do that how we want to. God's not going to tell us what to do, but God is teaching us all along the way how to do it. And in order for us to be a good apprentice, you really do love the master. It's not just like you are going to tell me, you know, the things I need to do, and it's going to be a, tra a transaction of information, because I can do get that from a book. I need to love, we need to love this, an apprentice loves a master in a, in a different kind of way, trusts the master to impart this knowledge and the wisdom. So that's different. God is more powerful than us. God is invisible. Third, and this goes with God being invisible, we need reminders to love God. When we love a person, you get the reminder every time you see the person. I have chose to love this person. Maybe it's easy, maybe it's hard, but the person is there in front of you and you have reminders by their presence. God is invisible. And so in our passage this morning, when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, it says, and these are all the ways that you have to remind yourself to do that every day because you are gonna forget. And so there, there are the post-it notes that it talks about. And this is uh, put the, this, this law to love God on a little scroll on a doorpost above your house. So you'll see it every time you enter and go in. It's called the mezuzah in Judaism. And if you go to a, into a Jewish home, you're probably gonna see that on the doorpost. They still do that today. They still say this prayer when they wake up and when they go to sleep every day. Sometimes more observant Jews or conservative Jews will as it says, put it on their wrist, a little scroll with love the Lord your God. Sometimes they'll put it on their, literally put it on their forehead. These are the post-it note reminders to love God. You know, I, I had this sticker once, and I, did, I love this sticker. I was like, I'm going to put it on every mirror in my house. It said, um, warning, images in this mirror are distorted by cultural um, understandings of beauty. So I put, it, I put that on every mirror in our house. <laughs> and I don't see it at all anymore. It's just like it's not even there, you know? And that's how you, what you do when you put post-it notes on. So the other way that we try to ingrain reminders about the need to love an invisible God is through our habits, through the ways that we make ourselves and train ourselves to do the sim same things over and over again. And so these are our prayer practices. These are the prayer we might say when we wake up or when we go to sleep or when we have a meal or when you get in your car that's always a good time to stop and say a prayer when you get in your car greeting people can we make a habit out of the way that we greet people so that we always greet people with kindness so that we always try to remember their name so that we always say something positive about them coming to church on sunday is a habit that helps remind us that we need to love god every day and doing that as a habit every Sunday. Our giving to those who are in need, to the church and to those who are in need, is a habit that we, reminds us of our need to love God. And then maybe the hardest one is teaching others. That comes up in the text. Teach this commandment to others. So are we teaching to others the importance of loving God? And of course, unless it's a parent-child relationship or a Sunday school teacher or whatnot, you're not going to be like going up to your co-worker and say, let me give you a little lesson on loving God. You, 
you try to embody that. You try to embody a love for God, which brings us kind of back full circle to love as a feeling and love as an action, and you love God by loving people. And I, Missy, I love what you, I love what you said. I love this idea of this, this, the way love emanates out of us, like our souls are expanding uh, into infinity, because that's ultimately what we're heading for with this love of God. It's this idea that not that love of God is a thing that we do now and not then, that we do it throughout our lives all the time, that we cultivate a posture of love, that we have love flowing out of us all the time, that we embody love, that ultimately we're aiming for this level of perfection, honestly, that we are always feeling God's love and sending it out into the world and feeling it and sending it out into the world, sending it to people, sending it to animals, sending it to creation, that it's just who we, it becomes who we are to love because God is love. And so then we have this union, this communion with God through that. And you might say, well, that's just idealism. You can't ever get, we aren't ever gonna attain that level of communion. But I wanna remind you of the words of the great Saint Vince Lombardi. <laughs> He was talking about football, but this is true for, for a lot of things. We will chase perfection, and we will chase it relentlessly, knowing all the while we can never attain it. But all along the way, we shall catch excellence. We, when you throw a dart at a dartboard, you are always aiming for the bullseye. I mean, unless you're really playing fancy darts, but <laughs> most of us are always aiming for the bullseye. Uh, and even though we know we're never, we're not going to get it very often, we don't turn around and I'm never going to get the bullseye, so I'm going to throw the dart this way. We never do that. We always aim for the bullseye. So it is with our love of God. We're always aiming for this communion with God, with love that flows through us and out of us all the time. And if we aim for that perfection of love in everything we do, we will never attain it. It's true. But along the way, we will catch an excellence in how we love God and how we love others. And that is our goal. Amen.